Hello and welcome to the week in 60 minutes. I'm your host this week, John Connolly, The Spectator's news editor. Coming up on the show, the lockdown files. This week, The Telegraph has obtained over 2.3 million words worth of Matt Hancock's WhatsApp messages from during the pandemic. Fraser Nelson, Spectator's editor, will join me on the show to discuss the messages. Elsewhere in Westminster, Rishi Sunak is looking more secure in number 10 after his Northern Ireland Windsor framework deal. Katie Balls joins me to discuss. In this week's magazine, Peter Frankopan writes that Putin is winning over the rest of the world when it comes to the Ukraine war. The historian Anthony Beaver joins me on the show to discuss whether he's right. And in Europe, is Georgia Maloney becoming the next Angela Merkel? Nick Fowle joins me to discuss. And after 200 days of blackouts last year, which continued this year, the politician James Lorimer joins me from South Africa to discuss if the country is falling apart. And finally, our columnist Douglas Murray has been on a tour of American universities last week. He joins me to discuss the difference between information and wisdom and the attacks on founding father Thomas Jefferson. Before we get going, if you enjoy Spectator TV, do make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Just click the subscribe button at the bottom of this video and click the bell icon so you never miss an episode. Fraser Nelson has been conspicuously absent from the Spectator's offices these past few weeks. Where has he been? He's been locked in the dungeons at the Daily Telegraph, sifting through Matt Hancock's prodigious WhatsApp messages from the pandemic. Fraser joins me now to discuss the messages and how they affect how we see lockdown now. Fraser, thank you for coming on Spectator TV. Now, obviously, much of the news has been dominated this week by Matt Hancock's WhatsApp messages. The Telegraph's got hold of thousands of them from during the pandemic. I mean, they said there's 2.3 million words, enough for the King James Bible. You've been, you spent the past couple of weeks in the Telegraph office going through these messages, sifting through them. Um, what, what struck you the most reading them? The funny thing is that the big, to me, the biggest story is one that you can't actually put in the front page of a paper. Mm. I mean, there are individually, there are lots of jaw-dropping moments, but when you see them all, as I have done, look at these thousands of messages, then what jumps out at you, first of all, is what's not there. Mm. Like, you'd think if you're going to tell children to put on masks, there would be some kind of evidence, and the evidence isn't there the whole time. And then secondly, it's the kind of nervous system that you see. This is a political nervous system. We're all very worried that so-and-so is doing, the Nicola Sturgeon's doing this, maybe we better catch up with her. And then, Nick, and then Chris Whitty has said, look, Chris, is there any scientific evidence to this? He'll say, well, maybe, maybe not, it doesn't really matter, it's not worth the fight. Mm. But Chris Whitty saying it's not worth the fight isn't a scientific judgment, it's a political judgment coming from a scientist. So we now see, when we were all told that we're following the science, just the form that took. So you get to see, not so much in the big stories, but more of the smaller day-to-day conversations, the role these scientists had. They were basically, they were mute quite a lot of the time, they were you know, saying stuff, they were, but they were be, allowing themselves to be used. In a way, for example, that Anders Tegnell in, in Sweden, who led his response, would never allow himself to be used. So this was very much a political uh, response to the pandemic, with science being invoked as political cover, and scientists as well being invoked for political cover. Would you go as so far as to say that the public have been misled about this? Like you say, they've been told throughout the pandemic that a lot of decisions have been made for, the, for scientific reasons, and now it seems like the opposite. Well, certainly there are occasions where they lied and, and where the public were at now misled. Um, I mean, when children were told to wear masks in corridors, for example, um, Gavin Williamson appeared on TV saying, we always listen to the best scientific and medical advice. Now, we've now got the, uh, the message thread at exactly that stage, and it wasn't anything to do with science or medicine, it was about to do with politics. Now, of course, that's more misleading than outright lying. Gavin Williamson, we also know, was fighting for the children to learn unimpeded from masks and was fighting to keep the schools open, and for that, he was attacked and mocked fairly mercilessly by the WhatsApp thread. Mm. And that's the other thing that I noticed, that what WhatsApp gives you in a way that no other document dump could is a psychological profile of how this group of men who had untrammeled power uh, went from being fairly open-minded about lockdown within a few weeks to thinking, okay, this is what we want to do, and then it got sectarian. It was sort of language you're more used to finding on Twitter. You can now see is used by government ministers. So they start to see themselves as heroes. That's a word they use quite a lot to debate who's the biggest hero. Um, and they are anti-virus, and anybody who opposes them, even within the cabinet, so Rishi Sunak, Alok Sharma, um, Theodore Agnew, the Lords, they're regarded basically as being in the service of the virus, and people who don't want to stop the virus. 
So that's an incredibly pejorative way of talking about somebody. Of course, Rishi Sunak wanted to stop the virus, but he was trying to talk about a balance of risks. Mm. So you end up with this mentality. I think to me, that's what jumps out a lot, that the government was being run, first of all, by WhatsApp groups. That was never an appropriate form. But they had, in the way that all WhatsApp groups do, they take on their own sort of psychology. And this psychology was lockdown being seen as a political campaign. And the enemies, of the, well, the world capital of their enemies was Sweden, of course. And there was lots of chat. Uh, any, any stories suggest Sweden's in problems, they, they get shared quite gleefully on the right. thread. Yeah. Um, and um, Matt Hancock um, talks, he says, all right, I, I, I want you to give me some evidence about why Sweden doesn't work. Mm. You know, rather than say, actually, Sweden's bought back, fought back two waves without lockdown. How do they manage it? What can we learn? It's a sectarian sort of political mindset. Now, the language of politics is different to the language of science. The language of science um, invites refutation. Mm. I've come up with a theory, it may not be right, so let's test it. Only if it's empirically tested will I believe it to be true. So you're quite humble with a theory. You start, you wait for the tests. The language of politics and the method of politics are very different. This is what I believe. I'm going to disparage and destabilize my opponents. I'm going to call them names. I'm going to rough them up. Um, and this pandemic was fought using the language and the methods of politics mm. when it pretended to be using the language and method of science. Mm. And you mentioned there that one of the most interesting parts of seeing these messages is the fact that we're almost in the room as these decisions were being made. We're seeing what people were thinking, though, in a very, in a very, wall, very, yeah. but a very odd way. Did you, did you find the messages from Boris Johnson quite interesting and sort of seeing the way that he was sometimes pushing back against his advisers? Did you think that maybe we could have ended up with a different policy if things had been done in a different way? He blows hot and cold in the messages, mm. Boris Johnson. Now, he, there's no doubt that the biggest challenges to lockdown do come from him. Mm. He sort of pops up now and again to say, hang on a minute, uh, oh, are we really sure we want to do this? Normally you feed him an opinion poll and he goes away, right? Because public opinion played a major part in this. Uh, I mean, of course, it shouldn't do. You should be thinking about how to get through a pandemic with a fewer life lost. But they were, you were thinking, OK, we don't want to go too far ahead of public opinion. Um, so Boris Johnson emerges as somebody who is trying to think for himself. You get the impression that he's uncomfortable with his gung-ho mentality of the advisers. Mm -hmm. But when he goes off the thread, then you see them talking about him like he's a problem to be managed right. rather than a leader to be followed. Mm. And I think, so during the pandemic, I think, political leaders were given a lot of space to make mistakes and that a lot of people recognised that they were facing an unprecedented virus that they didn't know mm. a lot about. So there's a lot of forgiveness. It might have been shambolic at times, but they thought, we'll, we'll give them a chance because it's difficult. Do you think these messages are going to shift that view and that people are going to be a bit less forgiving of the way they handled lockdown? Well, I, think if you, I think you need to separate what things were like at the very beginning, when nobody knew anything. We had this pandemic hurtling towards us. There were credible threats that a quarter of a million people could be dead. Uh, so at that stage, of course, the only option open to anybody in government was to make very difficult, very big decisions, a lot of which were going to be wrong. Mm. There was simply no way that anybody in any country was going to avoid that. But you tolerate these emergency powers on the condition that you learn from these mistakes that you will correct. You'll think, OK, we've got no evidence now. But by the end of April, you had lots of evidence. You see how the pandemic was working. You saw how Sweden had turned about with that lockdown. You've got a lot more to go on. You would expect, therefore, error correction to take in. But what this didn't factor in was that the political mind is such that you don't really like committing to mistakes. You get entrenched. And in a way, the bigger the call you make, the more you're likely to defend it. For example, let's take um, the decision to invade Iraq on the basis that Saddam is saying are weapons of mass destruction. Now, we know in the months that followed, it emerged that no such weapons were found because they didn't exist. So even then, Tony Blair found it very difficult to accept that he had launched a war on a false premise. That's not because Blair is a wicked man, because of the cognitive bias which affects all humans, politicians especially so. Mm. So in a way, you could argue that any 12 people plunged into that situation, given absolute power and no transparency, not answerable to the cabinet, let alone parliament, let alone the public, would have acted in that way. But the big question here is not to litigate the past. I'm mm. personally not very interested in what Mancock, Matt Hancock said or what he didn't say. What matters is how to make sure when the next pandemic comes along, as it will, there will be a new pathogen fairly soon, that we've got an apparatus in place and we have learned the lessons. But how are we supposed to learn any lesson if we can't discuss what went wrong? Because all of this is in the hands of an inquiry, an official inquiry, whose remit seems to be to kick this into the long grass 
and to make sure no politician has to answer anything until the general election or afterwards. Um, a lot of the spectators coverage during the pandemic was critical or asked whether the downsides of lockdown were being considered enough when they were being introduced, for example, the economic impacts, the social impacts and so on. Do you think that view is going to be vindicated by the messages that are yet to come out and that you've seen as well? Um, well, what, we, what I tried to do as editor, uh, what we all did in The Spectator, was to make sure that we didn't um, define public interest as being a government's megaphone or amplifier. We gave space to all sorts of views, including scientists very critical of what the government was doing. We ran articles and people very much supported what the government was doing. We gave a mixed view. I was just amazed as editor to find out how controversial it was to give a mixed view. How often I'd be called up by people saying, look, you can't give space to jo Dr. John Lee, he's crazy. You can't give space to Sinitra Gupta. This is not an Oxford epidemiologist, but, if you're on, but there was an idea that you were somehow letting the side down if you were even questioning what this Tory government was doing. Um, now, I, don't, I am quite prepared to believe a lockdown might be judged the right thing to do. But what I also firmly believe is that the only way we can do this is by an open and free debate, not by one which is edited by politicians or censored through the prism of an inquiry. So my bias, my agenda all the time has been towards journalism and journalistic inquiry. That's what The Spectator has been doing for 200 years and what we'll be doing, God willing, for the next 200. Thank you, Fraser. Meanwhile, Rishi Sunak has concluded a deal with the European Union over the Northern Ireland Protocol, his so-called Windsor Framework. Katie Balls, our political editor, joins me now. Katie, you write in your column this week that there's been a shift in the balance of power in the Tory party, with Rishi Sunak suddenly looking a lot more comfortable in number 10. Can you tell us what's brought about this change? I think that um, leaving as much room for things to change. Um, but I think as I also wrote last week, and as lots of others did, the protocol was really seen as a moment of danger for Rishi Sunak. And I think for good reason. If you look at how previous Tory leaders have struggled and grappled with Brexit, um, agreeing a deal with Brussels that also wins over the Tory party has often seemed a very difficult puzzle and no piece is more complicated in terms of fitting into that than Northern Ireland and what you do over the border um, to deliver Brexit and um, and managed to avoid all these issues. Um, so the protocol's been very thorny. And there were close supporters of Rishi Sunak who were effectively saying, don't go near this issue. Um, don't put the Northern Ireland Protocol on the back burner rather than renegotiate with Brussels because you just risk, in a pretty fragile situation, you think that's just six months ago in the Tory party, um, reopening old wounds, giving all your critics a reason to you know, bash you over the head and making things much harder in terms of governing. Now, Rishi Sunak decided to press on. He did initially delay it um, at, for various reasons, but I think one was some of the kickback from the DEP and the ERG. Mm -hmm. But over the weekend, talks progressed. On Monday, there was a deal. And I think so far, it's going pretty well for Rishi Sunak. Um, now, the deal itself, um, I think, in terms of Tory party mainstream opinion, is being received fairly positively. I think lots of people do think it is better than what Boris Johnson negotiated. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, the circumstances Boris Johnson faced were quite different um, in the sense that you think before the election trying to um, agree something um, and, and therefore I think it is not completely fair to say oh Boris Johnson and David Frost couldn't do anything and Rishi Sunak's come to the rescue but in terms of what he has achieved it goes much further. There's still some concerns in parts of this so for example one of the I think the big prizes of Rishi Sunak's deal is the Stormont uh, break mm. which um, if effectively gives a unionist um, veto in Stormont if, if it is sitting um, when it comes to new EU rules if they pull the brake and the UK government agrees. Now, that is something which I think is seen as very significant, mm. but you're already hearing, well, in what circumstances can this brake really be used? If you look at the EU text, it suggests it's much more, you know, an absolute last resort. Um, so that would suggest that you are going to keep getting some EU rules in Northern Ireland and therefore, you know, a separation. Mm -hmm. um, but I think even with that, you're looking at a much smaller rebellion when this vote eventually comes than lots of people were expecting. You had warnings of, you know, 100 Tory MPs could come mm -hmm. out against this. I think the sense is it will be under 40 right. and um, perhaps even, even getting quite a bit lower than that. Now, he's not completely out of the woods yet. We get the European Research Group verdict in the next week or so. Um, and th that group is divided on this. There are some who, who don't like parts of this. Um, we will be hearing from Boris Johnson um, at some point on this. And 
also, um, I think when it comes to the DEP, the DEP is also divided. So mm. there's a lot, so it's not a, you know, a complete success, but in terms of the problems Rishi Sunak could have had, it's turning out much better than his, uh, his own supporters thought it would. Mm. Do you think he's been helped as well by the fact that Labour aren't going to oppose his Brexit agreement? I'm not sure if he is helped by that or not, mm. because in the sense, um, <laughs> Keir Starmer's trying to sound very helpful. So in advance, he said, well, you know, don't worry about the ERG, Rishi Sunak. Don't worry, and this is, these are Keir Starmer's words, you know, about your Brexit hardliners because the sensible Labour Party is here. But of course, a Tory Prime Minister passing that business on Labour votes is a very tricky and dangerous mm. place to be. So in a way, I suppose it takes a little bit of the pressure off in terms of passing uh, this thing. And you don't even have to have a vote, but I think there is a sense to not have a vote yeah. um, would to would be to um, really rile people who would feel like they should be able to have a say on it. Um, but Rishi Sunak will not want to uh, have to rely on Labour votes. I mean, I think if, if he is able to get this um, through the House of Commons, um, ultimately, with a small enough Tory rebellion that mm. it does not, it not effectively demolish his majority, that would be a, a real triumph for the Prime Minister. And where does this leave another a former Prime Minister, Boris Johnson? You know, he's made sort of tensive uh, sort of steps towards uh, thinking that he might be able to make a comeback, for example. Um, he obviously hoped to make a big deal out of the Brexit deal. Where does this leave his sort of ambitions now? Do you think he's a, a sort of a comeback is looking a lot more unlikely now? So I don't think you'd ever want to completely write Boris Johnson off, and we have seen that over the years. Um, but I do think in terms of has this week been good for Rishi Sunak or Boris Johnson, I think in terms of the law of gravity, a good week for Rishi Sunak these days tends to be bad for his predecessor and vice mm. versa. It's um, actually been a surprise, surprisingly good week for Rishi Sunak. And some MPs actually in the centre of the party, they're not particular Sunakites, are saying this is probably his best week to date, mm. in the sense that Rishi Sunak looks a little bit like he has chosen to do something. He's not just being led by events. And that means that um, he looks much more in charge and has a bit more authority, um, rather than you know the circumstances he came into just mm. being drifting. Um, and I think for Boris Johnson, he clearly has been you know, planting the seeds to make quite a big intervention over this. If you look at the pre-warnings, some through sources close to Boris Johnson, but also direct ones saying stick with the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill. Now, we are going to be hearing from Boris Johnson. Um, we're speaking just before we will be hearing from speaking at an event where we're expecting some signals as to what he thinks about the protocol deal. Mm. But I think that this is not turning out at present to be um, a vehicle, an opportunity by which he could start to stage the beginning of a comeback because it feels as though it's not really the 2019 intake or you know the younger MPs who are getting exercised right. about this agreement. It's much more the old guard, you're a skeptics. And I, d I don't think that is where uh, Boris Johnson's you know comeback would come from. So um, it is it has not been the best week for Boris Johnson so far. Mm. And we should say as well, it's arguably the second victory of Rishi Sunak. It follows the departure of Nicola Sturgeon, which while he probably can't take full credit for, he did block, use Section 35 to block legislation there, which made her life more difficult. Do you think it's sort of these sort of victories are adding up for Rishi Sunak and giving him a bit more credibility inside the party? Yeah, I think they are. I mean, we're still speaking at a point when Labour have an uh, over 20 point lead, which is consistent, and that is by far the bigger issue if you speak to Tory MPs and small boats is the bigger issue. Um, but I do think for a Prime Minister who is coming in to really divided party with some big character predecessors still hanging around, I think there have been a few things which have suggested his slightly quieter approach mm. actually can pay off. So one, I think, as you say, was the Section 35 order. Now, I don't think it was the only reason Nicola Sturgeon went, but it clearly was a contributing factor, the fact that her gender self-ID policy was so unpopular. And when the Westminster government, for the first time ever, enacted that section to say, we're blocking this, um, you, you could see the SNP try to say, we're going to make this a culture war. Yeah blame the Tories, you know, look at them with their culture walls. And I think the way that Rishi Sunak went about it, which was very contained and calm and talking, you know, getting a legal argument in place, which Kemi Badenoch did a lot of work behind the scenes, right. but then making it a unionist argument with Alistair Jack fronting it, made it much harder for the SNP to, you know, point at the Tories. Mm. Um, and I think that has obviously paid off. And what this new protocol deal can do is I think it just adds to the sense that 
yes, Stormont's not back up and running yet, but it doesn't make things worse in terms of Stormont and it mm. restores um, some of the important things you might need in order to get that going. Um, you combine that with Nicola Sturgeon, I think you, you can argue that all this talk that the union would be broken up by Brexit, I think there's evidence that, that that is not appearing to be the case right now. And then secondly, I think it has the potential to improve wider EU relations. Mm. Um, so that could be, uh, and also you know, transatlantic relations because the US have been looking at this very closely, but we have the UK Franco summit coming up, mm. first one since 2018, uh, later this month. And that is very important, not just because Rishi Sunak wants to charm Emmanuel Macron, but because on the issue that I would say the bulk of the Tory party really thinks is the most important thing, small boats, some cooperation with France could go a long way. Mm. Do you think there's a risk that, I mean, Rishi Sunak has obviously showed that there are benefits to having a slightly better relationship with the EU over the Windsor framework, for example. But do you think there's a risk he ends up sort of angering the more Eurosceptic parts of his party by pursuing better relations with, with leaders like Macron, for example? Well, I think it is a risk because there's not results. Mm. Um, so if, if it just looks as though schmoozing maybe back to a more Cameroon approach at a time when the right of the party think there's too many concessions and there's no progress on these issues, then I think it's problematic. I think that even if you speak to members of the ERG who are yet to say they're back this, and I don't think all of them will back this um, deal, they still privately say that Rishi Sunak got more than they expected. Right. Um, so I think at the moment um, it, it's working in his favour, but as you point to, if this now ends up in um, lots of talks with Emmanuel Macron and actually no progress at all on boats, um, then I think people start saying, well, what about going back to the probably more combative approach that you saw both from Liz Truss and Boris Johnson? Brilliant. Thank you very much, Katie. Historian Peter Frankopan writes in this week's magazine that the world order is shifting in Putin's favour as countries in the global south align with Russia when it comes to the war in Ukraine. The historian and author of Stalingrad, Anthony Beaver joins me now to discuss whether Putin is actually winning. Anthony, thank you for joining us on Spectator TV. Now, um, in our cover piece this week by Peter Frankopan, um, he mentions that Putin is doing a good job as of cultivating alliances around the world, particularly outside the West, in Africa and Asia, for example. Um, do you agree with that thesis? Absolutely. Um, he's quite right. And um, I've remembered a number of people saying, even before the war, that we're losing the global south. Mm. Uh, and it's absolutely true. I think that we've took our eye off the ball with the whole obsession. And this is, goes back, really, to um, the beginning of the century, the new century, where uh, everything seemed to be in the Middle East and the threat seemed to be in the Middle East. Um, which also had military and strategic uh, consequences and the idea that uh, basically the conventional armies of the past were uh, a thing no longer going to be uh, relevant and that it was all going to be counter-terrorism and uh, uh, perhaps sort of urban warfare in the future. But um, it also meant that um, the way that sort of the former imperial powers if, uh, in Africa, particularly the French and the British and so forth, um, was started to be seen in a very different way. They were no longer seen as uh, benefactors or at least sort of assuaging a certain amount of imperial guilt by um, support and uh, aid. Um, and this is where I think we really did lose out. And the Chinese, of course, moved in first. Mm. And their policy of wolf diplomacy and of debt diplomacy um, certainly put themselves in a fairly strong position. Mm. Since then, of course, the Russians uh, followed suit. And I mean, it's unbelievably hypocritical uh, where to hear the sort of uh, Lavrov, who's very clever indeed, um, you know, attacking the West uh, for imperialism and all the rest of it, um, when we're seeing sort of, you know, um, a neo mercenary uh, imperialism taking place in Africa, in Mali, Central African Republic and um, elsewhere. Mm. You say, I mean, it seems like massive cheek, but at the same time, it is working. Do you yes, think that's mostly with the West's failing or sort of the success of Russia's strategy around the world to sort of win over allies? Uh, we had, our, we took our eye off the ball completely. There's no doubt about it. As we did in the 1930s. I mean, there was the idea in the 1930s, of course, uh, both amongst the British and the French, that nobody would be stupid enough to want another world war like the First World War. And of course, uh, that's why we underestimated Hitler. And ditto, the same thing happened really with Putin. 
Uh, the problem is that we've always uh, tended to make the mistake of confirmation bias, democratic confirmation bias, um, when we look at dictators, and we always get the dictator syndrome wrong. In what way, sorry, as in we misjudge their actions or we... Well, in terms, in terms of underestimating, yes, exactly, of underestimating, A, what their ambitions might be, because dictators do not even think in the same way as generals. Um, and quite often, you know, they will have an ideological fantasy, as Putin has this ideological fantasy, which uh, Franco, Peter Frankopan quite rightly covers in his uh, uh, article, but it could go further. Um, when you think of the idea, again, they attack, uh, Western imperialism, but uh, here we're seeing an attempt to restore the Russian Empire. Um, and it's based, interestingly, on the ideologies coming from the whites who were defeated in the Russian Civil War, yes. not from the Soviet Union at all. And this idea of Dugan and other ideologues, which does influence uh, Putin, uh, gives this idea that the holy Slav Orthodox mm. uh, world uh, is morally superior to the corrupt Western world, and that they have the right to take over the whole of the Eurasian landmass from Vladivostok to Dublin, as uh, they put it. It's very interesting because obviously we think of Putin as coming very much from the Soviet world. You know, he worked in the yeah. KGB, but you're saying essentially that his his ideology goes he, back further. It's almost like Tsarist in its... Oh, it is. Yeah, it so. is. I mean, he, uh, Putin brought back the bodies of white generals to be buried, mm. uh, put up monuments. Um, look at the uh, Palace on the Black Sea with all the double-headed gold eagles. Um, look, at, look at the interior of the uh, Kremlin. Um, mm. There's hardly a Soviet symbol to be found. Mm. Um, they're all former czars. Um, and of course, his great hero, hero is Peter the Great. Mm. So since the end of the Cold War, we've sort of been inclined to think of it as the age of sort of American hegemony. Do you think Russia and China are now properly challenged that? We're in the properly multipolar world now. Yes, I think we are. We are seeing the decline of the West for a whole number of reasons. Um, and uh, I don't think that there's very much we're going to be able to do about that. I think what we have failed to understand were the um, combinations of uh, huge changes in the rally of the early 90s. And I think it'll take historians another 50 years before they can work out whether all of these changes coming together, the end of the Cold War with the collapse of the Soviet Union, Big Bang, uh, the banking uh, revolution, end of exchange controls, invention of the internet, which meant, of course, that uh, corporations could access the cheapest labor throughout the world and also attract the best brains. And this is where one started to see uh, this huge polarization between, if you like, success and um, not failure, but I mean, if you like, poverty and extreme riches. Mm. And this is where the whole idea of control, that people have lost control of their lives. And this fear um, has been very much associated, of course, with a hatred of what they regarded as turbocharged capitalism. Mm. And we're seeing still the effects of this, and we'll go on seeing the effects of it. And I think this is why the West is starting to lose confidence in itself. Um, even though, as Frank Bann rightly says, you know, there is a temporary uh, um, unity in Europe and in the West at the moment. But how long that will last, it will be difficult to tell. Mm. I mean, you mentioned before that the West has sort of taken its eye off the ball. Is there yes. any way it can win over the, the rest of the world again, essentially? Well, I think that uh, what they need to do is uh, eventually a show, and they've been very bad in their propaganda. I mean, it's been absolutely useless in comparison to uh, the effectiveness of Russian propaganda. But I mean, it's to emphasize on the war crimes, um, especially if the war does come to an end. Uh, how it comes to an end, of course, is another uh, subject. But this is where I think it will be extremely difficult for any form of negotiation, because it's impossible really to believe in uh, conventional diplomacy mm. uh, when you cannot trust a word that Putin says. I mean, he will want a ceasefire um, and then make, make assurances that he will not attack Ukraine again, but the threat will be there. Mm. Uh, foreign companies won't be able to dare to invest in Ukraine. Um, so there is no real solution from that point of view. But uh, there is no doubt about it. Yes, he's right. We are into a, a multipolar world. Um, well, we say multipolar, but in fact, actually, it's going to be it's going to be Cold War Two. I mean, it's going to be a new split.
with uh, China Iran, on one side and, and China, uh, China, China and, and, yeah. and, and uh, you know, Venezuela and a whole lot of other uh, uh, countries, mm. um, normally with pretty unpleasant regimes, to put it mildly, mm. um, who will all uh, band together and be able to evade sanctions imposed by the West. Mm. Um, we should probably mention China in all this. They've yes. put forward a peace plan for Russia and Ukraine. I mean, what do you make of that? Is it entirely cynical or? Uh, I think it is pretty cynical, yes. Um, for China, of course, the vital thing is uh, um, the eye on Taiwan in one direction with, of course, in the Ukraine in the other. I mean, in a way, I was uh, wondering with what degree um, Xi uh, was, who was very nervous about any mention of nuclear weapons or anything like that, uh, might be frightened of the idea, even though I don't think it would ever happen, um, of if um, Putin did explode a, uh, a nuclear weapon in any form, that that might give uh, Biden the excuse to give, say, nuclear tip cruises to Taiwan or something like that, mm. uh, which would horrify him. I don't think there's any chance of that, but you know, it must be something in the back of his mind. Turning on to sort of the conflict in Ukraine at the moment mm. and how it's going, I mean, Peter took quite a slightly negative tone about how the war could do for, for Ukraine's prospects in that uh, the, the you know, defending country suffers the greatest losses, which are hard in a democracy. Yes. I mean, do you agree with that assessment? That, that, that Well, more or less, I think that, right that, there's no doubt about it that um, time is not on Ukraine's side. Mm. Uh, so much will depend on the delivery of tanks and um, aircraft and so forth. And this is why it's such a uh, vital element within Russian propaganda, mm. um, trying to turn the whole thing inside out as if it's, uh, um, you know, as if it's Ukraine, which has always been attacked uh, Russia from the start. So, um, um, but you know, as I say, the West's um, propaganda or counter propaganda has been absolutely, absolutely useless in that way. Mm. Do you think there's a positive element to take from all this, though, which is that we've seen a remarkable amount of Western unity when it comes to supporting Ukraine in particular? And that's sort of given us a stronger position when facing against Russia. Yes, um, I do. I think it's been a very necessary wake-up call. Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, when one sees, um, you know, Finland and Sweden and uh, the other and the frontline states and their determination, um, I'm sure as many um, senior commentators uh, uh, warned right from the start that France was always going to be very vulnerable, mm. particularly to combine this at the same time as uh, um, uh, increase in the pension and age and things like that, which is so. Um, and there are going to be one or two other countries which are going to be, uh, should we say, rather uh, dubious in their support uh, for Ukraine. But on the other hand, um, the frontline states are so determined mm. that providing, you know, Britain and the United States hang, hang in there, um, I think that uh, uh, Ukraine does stand a good chance. But it is a question of timing. Mm. It's interesting as well seeing Putin try to sort of uh, create fracture lines within the West. So, for oh, yes. example, he's talked about identity politics and uh, gender identity and that kind of thing. Do you think? Oh, yes. Well, I mean, I think that's extremely clever from his point of view. Um, <laughs> and the idea of, you know, we are offering stability, i.e., frankly, um, you know, reactionary policies about uh, whether it's about sex, which plays, plays very uh, well in Africa, of course, right, yeah, and yes. in any traditional societies and in the Middle East. Um, and this is where sort of, if you like, the, uh, uh, shall we say, that the, the liberal extremes, particularly in the United States, have been their own worst enemies mm. um, in terms of uh, perception or well perception. Um, but no, um, I think that uh, we are going to um, see not just the, uh, uh, the problem of uh, propaganda. We're also going to uh, see the way that uh, Putin has... Uh, uh, managed, I think, to uh, not necessarily outfox um, the West, uh, but certainly to sort of get it onto a back foot uh, mm. at this particular stage. And this is why the emphasis must be on uh, the destruction and the atrocities uh, committed in Ukraine uh, with, uh, and it certainly rattled them when it was first brought up, uh, with a war crimes tribunal, mm. which, of course, equates much more with Nazism and the end of Nazism uh, as opposed to uh, what uh, they would like to project as their scenario. Mm. Do you think that sort of hems Putin into a corner, though, possibly, if he knows that as a war, war 
well, war tribunal coming at the end of it. Well, Putin, Putin um, has always believed in divide and rule. I mean, this is where you have all of these rivalries between the army, Prigozhin, uh, Wagner, um, the National Guard and so forth, and GRU and FSB, etc., etc. Um, so as to maintain his position in power, mm. uh, rather in the same way that, you know, he believes in divide and rule in international relations. So uh, it's very much it's sort of his strategy. Um, but I don't think that that one is necessarily going to survive for too long, because if we do see a collapse in the Russian army in Ukraine uh, or um, a, real, a real shattering of morale, mm. um, and particularly uh, a, a threat to Crimea, which is not that difficult to maintain once they could get enough of an advance towards Mariupol uh, and bombard the Kerch Bridge, and then there's the Pericop Isthmus, um, then he really could be in a very more dangerous position because his popularity rating that went through the roof on getting Ukraine back in, uh, getting Crimea back in 2014. Um, and the idea that he might be losing it as a result of this war, um, then might find, one might find that Putin suddenly uh, goes off to the sanatorium in the old um, Soviet style while they sort out the yes, leadership yes. issue <laughs> afterwards. Yeah, as a, as a Gorbachev style. Um, do, do you think the sort of the risk of nuclear escalation, though, in the case, especially when it comes to Crimea, is, is, is overstated, or do you think that's, that should be a genuine concern? I think it's, I think it's overstated, but it rather depends on how um, they do uh, or treat the Crimea. Mm. I mean, I think the, 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 the way of doing it is not to start sending tanks straight in. Um, it's very much to cut off Crimea. Mm. I mean, it'd be quite interesting to see if they do manage to start uh, shelling the Kerch Bridge, uh, and they've got up to the Perikop Isthmus. Because uh, Zelensky the has said that Ukraine is a, a, a a war aim of Ukraine, hasn't he? He's yes. He's recovering that territory, so it's not... Uh uh, well, I mean, what's surprising though is that there seems to be very little, um, uh, should we say, uh, unity uh, in the West on what the policy should be. Mm. I mean, surprisingly, the head of uh, Scholz's party in Germany uh, said there is no limit to where any of these tanks could be deployed, which implies, of course, Crimea. Um, and the Americans have gone slightly hot and cold over the subject about whether they're going to uh, support a, an advance actually into Crimea. Um, so it's, it is, a, it is going to be a, a, a difficult one. And uh, um, whether it ever gets to the point that the West says, sorry, we're going to cut off the ammunition mm. uh, if you do actually move in, or um, gives it a sort of very reluctant green light, that will be something which can only be decided when it, we get to that particular point. Mm. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Anthony. Journalist Nick Farrell writes in this week's magazine about Georgia Maloney's vision for Europe. The Italian Premier, he says, could become the next Angela Merkel. Nick joins me now to discuss. Nick, thank you for joining us on Spectator TV. Now, the last time you were on the show, I think Georgia Maloney had just about been elected. Um, what's been going on since then and how is she getting on? Well, she's um, surprised many people. And uh, in the sense that uh, the global media virtually as one warned the world that Italy was about to fall to a far-right ergo-fascist uh, politician who was determined to dismantle democracy in Italy and beyond. Uh, she has no plans to dismantle democracy. And so they are having to change their tune and they either made a mistake or they deliberately uh, decided to say she was far-right fascist. Um, but I mean, I think that uh, they deliberately did it for political reasons. It wasn't just a simple, simple ignorance. I mean, they even said that her, her government was the most far right since uh, the fall of Mussolini in 1945, which is, of course, completely absurd because um, most of the post-war period, the Christian Democrats were in control and they were... Um, uh, against abortion, against homosexuality, clearly. I mean, Maloney obviously doesn't oppose either of those things. And so, and, and her reaction in, the reaction in Italy has been quite good to us, and she's doing quite well on the polls, is that right? Yes, uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, she, she got 26% in the election, which sounds, doesn't sound very much, but with her two coalition partners, um, Berlusconi's Forza Italia and Salvini's uh, League, um, they got enough 
seats to uh, enough votes to uh, get a very very large majority of seats in Parliament, and um, her support has actually gone up. To her person, her party support has gone up to thirty-one percent. So, whereas her opponents have her main opponents, the post-communist uh, Democratic Party, uh, have actually lost support. They got nineteen percent in the election and have gone down to sixteen percent. And and Nick, you, you, so you say she's she's very secure now on the domestic front. And you're saying in your piece this week for the magazine that she might also become sort of a, a leading figure in Europe, almost a sort of a a rival to Angela Merkel. Um, how do you see that sort of playing out? Well, yeah, I mean, that's that's sort of the main point of the piece, really. Um, she, she has, I mean, she, she has been very Eurosceptic in the past. At the moment, she's determined not to rock the boat. So uh, she, she's playing it very slowly um, and carefully and... Um, but nevertheless, uh, I mean, yes, I mean, as I say, I mean, she, if you think about it, I mean, uh, Angela Merkel was the dominant figure in Europe for many, many years. And when she <clears throat> left, she left a vacuum, which, of course, uh, President Macron wanted to fill, but uh, has failed, to put it bluntly. And the only other candidate <clears throat> who could, for the role, would be uh, Scholz, Olaf Scholz in Germany. But... I mean, he's renowned for nothing, renowned really just for dithering about, and uh, he doesn't seem to have any charisma. And so, and so she, so there's a vacuum, and there she represents, um, uh, let's say, a right-wing view as opposed to a centre, a centre-right view, which has always been the dominant view in Europe. You think she could see her make? make Europe a bit more pro-Atlantic? I mean, you mentioned that, that she comes from a more pro-Atlantic tradition on the Italian right that's quite unusual. Mm. Uh, that's very interesting, yeah, because um, she very, very, um, very clearly and boldly um, decided to switch the position of the Italian right on America well, well before the invasion Putin's invasion of Ukraine uh, in favor of America and rather like to try and create a special relationship rather like Britain's with America uh, where the default position is to support America's position. Uh, apart from Britain, she has been without a doubt America's most committed um, committed supporter on arms, and, arms to Ukraine and sanctions on Russia. And certainly she has been more committed than any other European leader, I would say, on that. As well, you mentioned that if she does sort of uh, get into a coalition with the EPP, it might, it might lead to sort of um, Ursula von der Leyen being, si being sidelined. Do, do you see that as likely? Well, um, the, yes. <laughs> yeah, well, that would be the, that would be the result. Um, the EPP uh, just uh, is the... Um, has to is the basically brings together the mainly Christian Democrat parties of Europe into a group, and they have traditionally uh, had the majority in uh, the European Parliament, but they've never had an absolute majority, and have always had to uh, run the show with uh, uh, in coalition with uh, other groups. So it has to ally with opponent its opponents, the socialists. But it obviously, um, it's been losing seats in the last 10 years or so. And it's, it would obviously love to ally with another group if it could, rather than its opponents, the socialists. And it has once or twice allied with the liberals, who are the third biggest group. And the plan is that uh, if they do well enough in the elections, uh, the plan would be to get Metzler who is uh, from the Maltese Nationalist Party and a member of the PPE to replace von der Leyen as Commission President. That would be that would mean a shift from soft right, if you like. I mean, uh, von der Leyen is uh, a member of Merkel's party, the Christian Democratic Union, Union CDU, and um, uh, so it would be it would mean a shift to the right.
Thank you very much, Nick. That's all we've got time for, but thank you. Ben Farmer, The Telegraph's Africa correspondent, writes in this week's magazine about South Africa's crumbling energy infrastructure, with country plagued by blackouts. I'm joined now by James Lorimer, a shadow minister for the Democratic Alliance Party in South Africa. Thank you, James, for joining us on Spectator TV. Um, now, we've got a piece about South Africa in the magazine this week. Um, it sounds a bit like the country is almost falling apart. We're getting blackouts of 10 hours a day. It's a huge disruption to businesses, schools, even food in fridges. Um, this is happening in one of the richest countries in the continent. Um, what's going on here? What's happened? This started 15 years ago uh, with uh, problems with electricity supply. It's been compounded since then and got steadily worse to the point now where, as you say, we're frequently off for 11 hours a day. Um, and you can imagine the effects on business and industry. Um, they are catastrophic. And there's no sign of anything being fixed soon. Uh, there are um, huge problems with the power company, the, the state power company, a company called ESCOM. Um, and uh, government does not seem to be able, even if it wanted to, to fix it. I mean, it's beset by corruption and poor decision making. And there seems to be very little prospect of the state electricity company being fixed. Right. And you say this has been years in the making. So I was saying here there's been a lack of investment in these sort of power stations that means they're failing now. Is that right? That's part of it. Uh, it started off with um, uh, the government being so impressed by the electricity utility, which was at that stage um, one in the early 2000s, um, um, acknowledged as one of the, certainly the best in Africa and one of the best in the world. Um, and government then took its eye off the ball and decided that the most important thing about the electricity company then was to get the demographic makeup correct. So it went on a program of racial transformation, um, got rid of old white technicians and engineers through a process of, of um, retrenchment and, uh, and, and not replacing them, and pulled in not only um, um, new people into the, into the company, but also um, a lot more people. So we now have a lot fewer uh, gigawatts being produced by almost twice as many people as, as there were 20 years ago. And um, together with a complete lack of, or not complete, but an almost complete lack of consequence for corruption, um, things have just got steadily worse. How bad, how bad is the corruption there? Can you sort of give us a bit more, tell us a bit more about that? <laughs> Biblical, epic. Um, there, there are three sort of main types. The, one, the first is that people are overpaid for work that they do or supplies that they deliver, sometimes to a massive degree. Um, for ex the, the example that came out last week was a, a pair of knee guards that should have cost £17 um, was being paid for uh, to the tune of about £3,800. So that's, there's, first of all, that kind of procurement corruption, call it. Then there's the stealing. And the stealing is of spare parts at power stations. The stealing is of copper cables. It is of oil and other um, fuel used to, to run these power stations. And then most of all, it's theft of coal. Now the power stations are designed to take a certain grade of coal. And as you may know, South Africa mines uh, a lot of coal. Uh, but then what happens is they, they carefully grade or they, they buy the right kind of coal from the, from the mine. En route to the power station, it then gets hijacked, uh, usually with the, the complicity of, of the, the truck driver. Um, it then gets substituted for very poor quality coal or even rocks. That then arrives at the power station, gets thrown in the boilers, which has a terrible effect on the boilers, which then keep breaking down. Um, and then there's the third type of corruption, which is to do with the maintenance contracts. And that is deliberately breaking power stations so that you can get contracts to repair them. And um, this whole drama has intensified last week with the resignation of the CEO of ESCOM, who lost the support of government in January um, and then decided to resign. And on the day he handed in his resignation, uh, somebody laced his coffee with cyanide. He was not terribly happy about this, as you can imagine, and did an interview on television, local television last week, in which he spilled the beans, in which we saw the extent of involvement by senior levels of government in the corruption and no moves to do anything about that. That's quite remarkable. Um, 
you say, as you say, it's been on the ANC's watch list. They've been in power for a long time now. Um, are they? Are, we, are you sort of seeing quite a big public backlash to this now, to the ANC in particular, or are they managed to sort of shift blame to the to the state energy company? They've managed to shift blame largely in in the in the um, political sense uh, for years, but it really came to a head the last few months of last year when we started getting these protracted power cuts. And more and more information started to come out about the kind of corruption that was happening there. And it's, it's really corroding ANC support now. Right. And could you even see the ANC being removed from power? Or do you think that's still a long time away yet? Yeah. No, it's certainly a possibility. Um, a number of uh, independent polls and also polling done by my party, the, the official opposition, uh, shows that they are now around 40 percent, perhaps less which is a big come down. You know, at the Zenith, the ANC were getting two thirds of the vote. Um, they're now around 40%. And it's difficult to see that turning around. I don't know what they're going to do. I think even if they want to fix the corruption, it's now so deeply entrenched that they can do very little about it. Mm. Um, let's talk a bit about the sort of the impact of these blackouts. Um, this must be having like quite a huge effect on the economy, um, especially mining, I believe. Is that right? Absolutely right. Um, it started off with um, industries like mining having to then um, get permission from the government because uh, power production was always a state monopoly. They had to get permission from government to start producing their own power. And a lot of them have put up uh, solar farms or wind farms um, to try and, and mitigate the effects of the power cuts. And you can imagine what happens when you've got thousands of miners two kilometers underground and the power goes off. You've got nothing to run the lifts to take them out. So it can be pretty scary. Um, then you also got the, uh, the the first stage was those energy intensive industries, things like metal smelting, which just couldn't happen anymore. And a lot of ferrochrome smelters, for example, which we used to do a lot of, those businesses have just closed and they're now shipping the raw, raw um, ore to China to do it there. And of course, now that's spread to retail too. So you'll go into a shopping mall and the lights will go off. Um, some of the bigger companies have started installing their own generators, uh, diesel generators. Um, and uh, but not everybody can afford that. Smaller businesses are going under uh, a pace. Um, so it really has spread across the economy. And although it hasn't started feeding through to the unemployment figures yet, and this is against a background of South Africa being one of the worst countries for unemployment worldwide. We have one of the highest rates of unemployment worldwide. So that's just going to get worse. It hasn't really started appearing in the figures yet, but we're expecting in the next three, four months for it to really start hitting. Right, I see. And there's been talk here that, you know, that, that this might lead to civil unrest in South Africa, um, possibly even civil war. I mean, do you think that's a bit, do you think that's likely to happen now? I think civil war is, is um, um, over-egging it a bit. Um, undoubtedly, there is going to be some sort of uh, civic unrest. There has been from place to place in the country. Uh, you know, when a, a smaller town is off for, for days at a time. Because I, I must just explain that, you know, the power cuts from the state power company are not the only power cuts you get. Because if you keep turning your electricity system on and off, the local grid infrastructure is not really designed for that. And it keeps breaking. So, for example, here where I am in Johannesburg, we frequently have outages of anything from 15 to 48 hours. And uh, there's a bigger chance of the entire grid falling over. If that happens, I have no doubt there is going to be some sort of civic unrest. Um, I don't think a civil war, um, but it's not going to be pretty. Mm. And I think as well, some have mentioned that sort of renewable, renewable energy can, can fill in the gap here. Do you, think, do you think that's a bit pie in the sky at this stage? It is. Um, there has been a very successful project by government allowing renewable energy to be produced by private companies. Uh, and a lot of it has become available. But again, because they haven't invested in the grid to distribute it, um, a lot of it can't be used. And so the areas of the country where they're building these projects, where there's lots of wind and lots of sun, are quite far away from the main urban centers. And they don't have the network to distribute it. So... Um, that is part of the solution. Um, President Cyril Ramaphosa has raised um, in excess of $8 billion from international um, lenders to start producing uh, more renewable energy. South Africa um, is a very high um, coal user. Uh, more than 80, well over 80% of our power comes from coal. 
Um, the problem is that that also looks like it's going to fall prey to the corrupt syndicates. The, um, the CEO of ESCOM, the man who's just resigned, a fellow called Andre de Reta, um, said in his TV interview that he had uh, raised with a cabinet minister that there should be greater safeguards to stop some of that eight billion in loans being stolen. To which the cabinet minister replied simply, well, you have to understand that people need to eat. Eat, of course, being a euphemism for corruption. My word. Uh, Even that is unlikely to work as it should because of this inability to stop the corruption, which reaches right into the cabinet. Uh, And there's much speculation at the moment as to uh, two cabinet ministers or two cabinet level people have been um, named, uh, or at least identified, their presence has been identified, although they haven't been named. I see. Well, it sounds like an absolute dire situation. Um, thank you for talking, us to, talking to us today, James. And finally, columnist Douglas Murray has been on a tour of American universities this week to discuss the decline of wisdom and the attacks on Thomas Jefferson. Douglas joins me now. Thank you for joining us on Spectator TV, Douglas. Um, you write in the magazine this week about your time touring American universities with the Common Sense Group. Um, can you tell us a bit about the tour and, and how it's gone? Yes, uh, um, I'm always very eager to engage in um, discussion, dialogue, debate and much more. Um, and uh, especially w- with students, because in America, as in, as in Britain, uh, there is an enormous uh, countercultural movement going on at the moment in our universities. And uh, I think it doesn't get uh, itself counted enough. So uh, I've been uh, day after day going to different campuses, uh, speaking among other things about, about getting uh, the past in some kind of historical context. Um, in America, even more than in Britain, there is this, this wild collapse of knowledge and um, context about the past. Uh, people, students, faculty and others seem to believe their job is to stand as judge, jury and executioner over everyone who came before them. Mm. And you write in particular about Thomas Jefferson. Now, I think most of us would know Jefferson as you know, one of the founding fathers, one of the first presidents, you know, quite a noble figure. You say these days it's almost like a mark of Cain to be associated with him. Can you, can you tell us a bit about that and, and why that, what's going on there? Yes, that's right. I mean, one of the fascinating things in American life in recent years, uh, as in British life, has been the way in which all of the central heroes have been sort of pulled down one by one. In Britain, we've seen this in recent years with the constant attacks on Winston Churchill and his memory, uh, Lord Nelson, Francis Drake, uh, it doesn't, doesn't matter who you, who you find are the heroes that many of us grew up with, all of them are looked at in the same remorseless light. It's even worse in America. Uh, um, because a new generation of students and, and rather poorly qualified professors have made amazing discoveries, such as the fact that the Founding Fathers uh, lived in a time in which slavery was commonplace. Um, Thomas Jefferson has come in for particular obloquy in recent years, uh, largely because of, of a story that has emerged since the 1990s, um, which claims not only that he was a slave owner, but a slave raper and that one of the slaves he inherited in particular um, uh, was, uh, was uh, the father of his children. Um, in actual fact, as I, as I mentioned in my piece and as I've been mentioning in speeches in the past weeks, uh, the DNA evidence on this is highly inconclusive. There is a, def- a Jefferson a gene within the DNA of Sally Hemings, the, the slave's uh, descendant, but it's by no means clear this is from Thomas Jefferson. It's much more likely that it's one, uh, one of a couple of ne'er-do-well relatives known to go to the slave quarters. Why does this matter? Um, I mean, it, 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 it wouldn't or shouldn't uh, wipe out in any case all of his other achievements, the Declaration of Independence, the Virginia Statute on Religious Liberty and much more. But, uh, um, but, but today, um, of course, it means that, fa- that, that not only the country, but institutions like the University of Virginia, founded by Thomas Jefferson, uh, feel the need to sort of uh, um, somehow dispense with their past or, or deal with their past as, uh, as racist institutions and as institutions founded also by a rapist, which is, I mean, a hundred years ago, if you'd have said that Thomas Jefferson was a rapist, uh, you would have found people quite angry that you'd made such a claim. Uh, today, as I found um, in recent, uh, recent uh, speeches, uh, uh, quite a lot of people are quite angry if you say that you think Thomas Jefferson was not a rapist. 
Um, so um, a, a lot has changed and it's changed very fast and with an awful lot of ignorance. Mm. Do you get the sense, I mean, so going around these campuses that this is a view held by the majority of students, is there a bit of a fight back going on, do you think, to sort of you know, view history in a more reasonable way? Yeah, the, I mean, the dimmer students have fallen for the woke stuff. I mean, there's no doubt about that. Um, uh, the ones who just, you know, heard like go along with, um, with, with, you know, the other, the other sheep on this sort of thing. Um, uh, the, the cleverer students, uh, in my experience, everywhere, are uh, finding their way through this. I mean, they recognise that, you know, it's sort of uh, unattractive and unsustainable to simply, you know, find guilty everyone who died before you were born. And, and it's also not very interesting. I mean, there's so much of interest in the life of somebody like Thomas Jefferson, as with all the founding fathers, who are remarkable figures. Uh, there's so much that's interesting about them. There's just nothing very interesting about being a uh, retributive, uh, priggish, ill-informed uh, individual who just wants to find everyone guilty of, of living in, you know, the 18th century, for instance. You know, I mean, I mean, I mean you know, lo and behold, who'd have guessed, John, that, uh, that, that, that people who lived before we were born had uh, different attitudes to us on a range of things. Doubtless people who come after us will have different attitudes themselves. Heaven forbid, yes. Um, and you sort of allude to as well in your piece about the fact there's been this big reckoning over even the date that America was founded. Um, I think you're referring to sort of the 69 Project. Can you tell us a bit about that and how this kind of influenced things as well? Yeah, there's a, there's a very, very ill-educated, ill-informed uh, woman called Nicole Hannah-Jones. Nicole Hannah-Jones is not a historian. <laughs> She's not anything as far as I can see, except that the, the New York Times, in their infinite wisdom, decided to make her the sort of chair of this project that decided, in its own words, to reframe the American founding and to reframe it to 1619, which was the date when when slaves were first brought onto the American continent. Um, this is, of course, a completely um, a malevolent rewriting of American history. It's an attempt not to just say slavery happened, which it did, as it did in every civilization around the world, but that slavery is the sole lens to look at America through. Uh, it's like saying that racism or colonialism, which also existed in, in our past as they did in all pasts, are the only way to look at our past. And of course, as I say, that's an entirely malevolent rewriting. It's, if, if you did this to Brazil, it's perfectly possible you could do it to Brazil. You could do it to Nigeria. Um, I mean, uh, the, the most odious slaving was continuing in Nigeria, modern Nigeria, um, you know, into the 20th century. Uh, Britain and others fought about this. But if you said, you know, Nigeria is just this country with its original sin and there's nothing good to be said about it, most Nigerians would quite rightly, uh, you know, chase you out of town and, uh, and, and say this isn't fair. But Nicole Hannah-Jones and others have made this claim about America. They have fundamentally altered the debate in America, not because of the strength of their arguments, uh, they never defend their arguments because they don't have arguments. They just have assertions. And Nicole Hannah-Jones and others will not debate their assertions in public. They simply say, they simply throw out bombs and then say, uh, I refuse to platform anyone who disagrees with me. That's because their ideas, their claims don't stand up to even the slightest scrutiny. But nevertheless, it's caused another um, series of serious frictions in America. And as I mentioned in my piece, uh, there's a sort of counterfactual here, which is not just the counterfactual of the 1619 project, but if we'd have gone back a couple of decades and said, you know, what are we going to spend our time debating in the world's most advanced democracies in Britain and America? Uh, um, you know, we might have thought 20 years ago, well, gosh, it was since we've got the internet and access to all this knowledge and the opportunity to exchange ideas, we might solve all sorts of things. Instead, you know, we're discussing things like what's a woman and uh, when was America founded? So actually, we've become stupider. And um, I, for at any rate, I at any rate blame people like Hannah Jones and her fellow fabulists. And, uh, and, and I wish they wouldn't hold everyone back. I mean, Douglas, you mentioned there that we thought we'd use the internet for great things. I mean, how much do you think the internet can be blamed for this? I mean, in terms of elevating quite shrill or unpleasant voices that, that probably would have been ignored in the past. Well, as I mentioned in the piece, you know, there's a, there's a quote that Henry Kissinger gave to The Spectator nine years ago or so. He said, everyone's got the, this access to this knowledge, but where's the wisdom? 
Uh, he referred to Lord Salisbury and uh, the way he acted whilst he was Prime Minister of Britain. Um, y- you have to have time to acquire wisdom. If you just got constant access to knowledge, y- you might well miss the wisdom. Uh, uh, we live in a time when any student can open their iPad and you know, Google something and say, ah, I see uh, that this fact is there. But, but the context of things, the wisdom of things, is getting entirely lost in this unbelievable febrile certainty, which is fueled by very ignorant people with tiny amounts of information at their disposal. I don't harp on about her because she's not a very interesting figure, Um, but um, Nicole Hannah-Jones and her colleagues at the 1619 Project uh, talk about the um, American founding and don't seem to think that the Declaration of Independence is in any way a suggestive or useful or important document, something which I, I demur from. Yes, and I imagine Jefferson would be turning in his grave as well a bit if he said that his, his declaration didn't matter. Brilliant. Um, thank you very much, Douglas. It's a great pleasure. That's it for this week. If you enjoy Spectator TV, make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Just click the subscribe button at the bottom of this video and click the bell icon so you never miss an episode. Thank you for watching. Thank you.